Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. I um I will thank you for being here and sharing your stories and knowledge and wisdom with all of us. I guess my question is for Henry. Um, I have a child as a son who's uh, on the spectrum, and he's entering high school, and it's been a bit bumpy. It's been rough. Um, any suggestions or ideas? I know it's very general and broad, and doesn't matter. But any general suggestions, advice for parents and families who have you know neurodiverse children transitioning into high school and things like that? Twinks. Yeah. I think transitions print anything is a struggle. It's not just transitions to high school, right? And, I, and these are things that I often ponder. Um, I guess like, you know, my son is still in daycare and he's going to kindergarten um, next year in September. I think um, one of the things that has been helpful in terms of kind of framing it as a transition is definitely preloading him. Um, for example, like before, um, when we go to different places, like going for hiking in the canyon before I still remember, right? Um, when I, I guess at that time, I didn't really kind of explain to him what's going to happen, what we're going to do over there. He, did, he was panicky. He didn't want to go and get out of the car, right? So um, my wife and I were really stressed out and not happy, you know. But I think it was just this, uh, a feeling of desperation, right? But when I think about it now... Um, because this past summer, when we actually brought him to, when we brought him to Agri-Fair in Abbotsford, it's totally brand new experience to him, right? So we talked about, we actually showed him YouTube videos of uh, what Agri-Fair looks like, right? Oh yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, take a look at animals and we're going to, um, you know, maybe go on rides if he wants to and things like that. And it actually really worked out. Like we, we brought him there, we stayed there for three hours at Agri-Fair and at the end, he didn't want to leave. He wanted to go on the Ferris wheel. Um, I brought him to bumper cars and really enjoyed it, right? So I think having that preloading on him and just talk to him and just show YouTube videos of him of what high school looks like in your situation, I think would, um, would be really helpful. It just goes a long way to, um, uh, to reduce anxiety because I think with transitions, a lot of it is about anxiety, right? And just not sure what's going to happen, right? Especially with autistic individuals, right? Where um, transitions could be uh, really stress-inducing. So hopefully that answers, hopefully that helps. Um, thank you guys all for your, your wonderful uh, stories and very booming. Just wonder, is there any sort of things or one of the big things but you since is the employment industry and a lot of good about help difficulty at that full-time job, that, that navigating managers and all of that. Is there any, anybody on the hell and has any sort of tips for us that help as a parent or as a, as a caregiver or as a, it comes to how we can help youth in that piece? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> because I didn't get a full-time job, a steady employment, full-time job for an extended period of time until I was around 33, back in 2018. And I was struggling with just going with uh, less than part time work, right? Um, as a BI at first. So. Uh, but one of the things I can say is that I think when I worked, right? But I think I feel it's, it's, it's in a way unique for me because I'm on, I, I, I'm autistic, right? So it's really easy for me to, um, disclose myself, right? Even uh, during interviews, right? Um, you know, I'm autistic, you know, I'm on the spectrum and things like that, right? Um, my first full time job. Um, is, you know, I, I'm a parent coach with getting the mental health, um, getting mental health, um, C C C C C C CMHA, right? So I, I still remember that thing when during the interview, I actually disclosed myself um, as being autistic. So I think hopefully that goes a long way in terms of um, breaking down the barriers, right? But obviously, you know, not everybody is comfortable with um, readily disclosing themselves, right? So it is a difficult journey. Um, and I always feel that for me, um, being on the spectrum, right? I don't know if that's like the statistics, right? But I feel like a lot of individuals have a lot of talent. They're really smart. They have a lot of talent, but they, um, their jobs don't reflect their amount of talent and their money earning, uh, money earning ability for lack of a better word. Particularly for Jiao, but 
comes for anybody, I would like to, to focus on our attention on three things. The first, our network. The sooner they start to build that network, the better. Um, we use social networks all the time. There are also social networks for working. LinkedIn, I use that, and I keep as a repository of my contacts. And that gives me the opportunity to tap into the hidden market before the job post is out there. I want to get to know those people who could be crafting those job posts and for me to reach out to them and to tell them, I'm here, I'm happy to help. So let's not um, underappreciate the value of a network. The second is the preparation for the interview process. It's a tough world out there. And when you need to face an interview, still good progress has been done, but we are facing a market that is looking for the quote unquote best and brightest. There are still resources out there that can help everybody, autistic, neurotypical, or BC, and others will have workshops and will have tools to position yourself to get that employment. And the third one is once you get hopefully your dream job, how to keep it, how to persevere on it. And remember, for an autistic or for a person with a disability, the top question to disclose or not to disclose, like Shakespeare, uh, it's up to you. But be prepared also to bring your rights, either legally or not, and not saying illegally. I'm, talking, I'm referring to talking with your manager, finding the best way to perform at work with the resources that you have. I have faced also the request for accommodation from a legal perspective, and still there is work to do. But don't forget there are rights out there for each of us. I hope that answer, that helps to answer the question. Um, one thing that I, even though I look back, right, one thing that I really wish I could have gotten um, as a young adult, because I did, uh, I did not, I didn't have any BR sessions. I had life skills workers taking me out outings when I was a kid after diagnosis at Sunny Hill. But one thing that I really wish I could have had is a life coach, a, a career coach um, who specializes on our disability. I never had that because sometimes I feel like I was born in a wrong era because I feel like um, a lot of kids now have a lot better support, including my son. But um, yeah, definitely something that I would really wish I've had, and not just for career, but in terms of um, dating skills, in terms of relationships, in terms of, uh, as you said, like um, kind of growing your support network and career network and your friendship network. Actually, I'm going to say that right now. My son is 16 and he has autism. And we're talking about his transition to adulthood because I really want him to have a better transition than I had. Um, so uh, I, um, I got him to do some research on what he likes. And so he's chosen movies because he can list them off and he can label them. And, and so he actually went online and he looked and applied and uh, he knows where he wants to work. And so I just try to encourage that. And, and uh, I remember when I, when I was a manager at a uh, center, this, um, Disabilities Alliance, I think, came and um, they sponsored uh we paid for half the agent and they paid for the other half of the um, we sponsored them. Um, so it's from each, uh, yes, they're about 17. But yeah, it was really nice to have them around. And um, it, I felt I felt like I was like, <laughs> well, I have people around me that, <laughs> that could understand me. So, but there are programs out there too to help. So I hope that helps. So. I guess this question's for everyone, but it's specifically Javier. You mentioned that networking is a really important piece. Um, in terms of job searching, do you have any recommendations for people who are in your diverse and maybe had social challenges or a low social battery in kind of conjunction with trying to network? In Thank you. Uh, to the question, how to network for an autistic person, again, maybe for anybody. Uh, if you see this room full of qualified people, what a perfect place for networking. Guess what? Maybe an autistic person as in like 50 people in a room. Yes. Therefore, the value of trying the one-to-one, -one, and that's where the value of the network comes. You grow your network, you find those people in those positions, decision makers try to give a shot and ask for a telephone call, or even better, for an 
15 minute coffee uh, at the coffee shop nearby the place of work and start to build that network on a one to one as opposed to I need to go to the career event from the career center at UBC at SFU and I will feel all my sensory issues and I will feel overwhelmed and will get not so much from that. So give me a try on the one to one. In my case, asking for a one to one phone call. As all we receive a yes, I haven't faced a no. And I think it's something that we can give a try. And Rio, everybody else wants to add in. It's the way. I think one to one, it's a really good idea just because I think there's just much more opportunities to have a closer um, connection, right? Rather than going to a job fair. I, I absolutely agree. Um, this question is for Robbie. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you for your vulnerability because your vulnerability is a gift and it just really like moved me as someone who also has a history of sexual violence. I think that when I started to look more into neurodiverse experiences or neurodivergent experiences, um, specifically autistic girls are much more likely to experience sexual violence in their life. And I think it's something that we don't talk about enough. So your story today, I think is just really important. Um, in terms of my question, um, I was just curious, like in your healing journey, what has been something that has really helped you, um, personally? Perfect. Um, and dancing. Um, and I could, I could just paint everything away. And actually, after I painted, if it was something that was like traumatizing, I would smash it, uh, smash it lots, as in uh, throw away, because then that that hurt is gone. And so that that movie helped because I was very aggressive, just because everybody took 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 took. You know, like it's fine. And everybody just wanting to give or be with me. So. Um, and I've been in counseling ever since tiny. So I had a parent that sexually abused me, and I've met cousins, and um, been around artistic professionals. So um, talking uh, is hard, but my counselor got she's she's so good, <laughs> she's so good. She understands me, she understands my autism. So finding somebody to back and understand, but like, you yeah, have autism in girls is so different sometimes because. We, we present differently. And then, yes, we are um, sexually assaulting more likely. But I just think if you get to be there for somebody, I think art, arts and crafts that's a, is the way to go because you don't have to look at, you know how it's hard to look. I'm looking at your eyebrows. I feel when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at your eyebrows. But uh, if you're side by side, that's how that healing happened because I was able to, it was like a, something was there but wasn't there, helping me along. So if you could do side by side, that's really neat. Oh. I think my question was, if you could go back and be that person that you needed at 18, what would you do for you? Well, that's a good question. I never ever seemed to go back. Um, mm -hmm. But if I was to go and talk to each little frothy, I'd be like, be the beer alone. Uh, and um, playing mom. My mom what happened, and that memory of the teacher that hurt me for that year, that whole year, just came up last year because I was assaulted by my landlord. Um, I couldn't read the cues, and he, um, I, I thought I had to because I couldn't make my rent, so um, I misunderstood everything, all the cues, well, um, and that's where that memory came, and uh, I didn't tell them all, and so I just... And I told her and told my, my boyfriend what happened. And then all those other memories came. And so not that ready to charge him yet. Because like the 12 year old me is scared. So I'm doing a lot of self-talk. So it's like a lot of you're okay. If you're safe, you got to tell someone. Um, so encouraging somebody because I have my partner going to encouraging me. And there's centers like the Surrey, the Women's Center. They're doing all the work for me. Like they're going to talk to the police. They're going to, so I don't get re-traumatized because I told them, I said, I've gone to the police three times before and they said, what did you do wrong? And then I was sexually assaulted by, um, I, um, 
And also, so for those of us with anxiety and stuff, you can imagine that I'm, and I got my rating. That's so when you see people like that, we're just we're nervous. <laughs> we're just nervous and I um cool. I hope that answered your question. Sorry. Thank you. Again, um, I don't want to be hogging the mic, but just the thing that's resonating for me right now, and this goes back to something that Damon had also said in his video, which was the touch, touch your nose, touch your nose, touch your nose concept. Uh, in this neurotypical world, whatever that is, where we've historically made efforts to make autistic people fit in, it's compliance-based. And when you teach people to become compliant, you put them at a huge risk of being abused. And that's just the thing that's going around in my head right now. Uh, because we think about schooling and we think about the education system. And I spent 35 years in education and I've seen autistic kids have meltdowns. Why? Because she made them stop doing something that they, they were really good at, that they really enjoyed doing to make them do something that they don't want to do, aren't very good at, and, and they're doing that with somebody that they don't want to be with. You know, there are all these things that we do. And I, I mentioned earlier um, to someone, Greg Hanley made the comment once that autistic people are the only group of people where when we figure out what they're really good at and what they like to do, we make them stop doing that. And I just think that that's, something that flows into the conversation around the employment questions as well. So what is it that people are really good at? How do we encourage that? And how do we presume competence? Um, uh, thank you all for sharing. Um, what just popped into my head was, um, if any of you want to share just a little bit of what is your, um, I would say like autistic joy. So something that is like, special interest um, that brings you a lot of joy, right, in your life or in the past? For me, reading maps, just um, see, like, when I was nine, uh, because like, I think part of the reason for me is, well, you know, when I was in grade three, four, or five, right, um, I was in ESL, right? So obviously, English is my second language, Cantonese is, right? But I still feel like when I read chapter books, I have long struggles but just because, I have a hard time trying to associate uh, the words, right? With imagining what is happening visually in my mind, right? So for me, um, for some reason, like I, I got so obsessed with reading street maps that that's oh, obviously this is pre-internet, right? So just reading street maps and things like that. And that brought me joy as a kid. But even today, sometimes I, I, you know, I would just go on Google Maps and look at street view and just keep your know, for curiosity, kind of take a look at what those streets look like in different different places around the world, right? And you know, and what did that re and it really helped me because I had a um, very fortunate opportunities to go on going on long road trips when I was in grad school in Minnesota. And I would um drive to New York City from there and going up to um Northwest Ontario, around Lake Superior, going down to the south to Arkansas, right? So those really helped me. Um in terms of what I do for enjoyment, uh, that and um, you can have cars. Um, I drive. I drive a Golf GTI uh, 2016. So it's that you know. So and one thing that really brought me joy it, it, that is just looking at different ideas how I can modify my car. You know, increase power, and lowering suspension, and things like that. But obviously, something that my wife isn't really fond of. <laughs> I do. I've been obsessed with cars since childhood. So you know. And those bonds are not cheap, right? So it is such struggle. Um, you know, th th this is kind of the theme that revolves around my life, right? I really want to get there, right? You know, I, I, I really wanted to achieve or do something that I want, but because a lot of these, a lot of these either uh, anxieties that I went through uh, when I was younger as a result of my experiences being on the spectrum, right? And also just difficulties in general with social skills and stuff, right? Um, these are, and this is a, a huge battle for me that has led to, uh, to my anxiety and depression. In fact, uh, when I was in grad school, um, I was going through some really hard times. I was on, on, uh, on my path to suicide, right? Um, just going through struggles with academic programs and, 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 and my practicum, right? 
And one um, psychologist at, at, the, at the university in Minnesota at the time was not very helpful. In fact, he had the gall to tell me that I'm like a, a person who's blind, who wants to become a pilot but cannot. That was really shocking to me. I was, um, but, but then be, for me, as an autistic individual at, at that time, I didn't have an immediate reaction because I'm just trying to, because I was so traumatized. So I, I just couldn't process what's going on. But uh, for some time later, I was very, very mad, right? Um, so these types of um, things I've experienced, it, it's a huge stumbling block for me. <laughs> Thank you. Just quickly, if I can also share, uh, it's important to find what gives you joy in life. Sounds very basic, but in my case, I mentioned that I like going to the gym. I'm from Colombia, a country where soccer is a second religion. I was a senior. I was the worst in the team. Uh, my motor skills didn't make it to, to be a good player. Uh, by coincidence, I switched high schools uh, in the middle of my high school, and the new school had a brand new gym. And there was a trainer who was teaching me, and I say, this is my thing. And again, not everybody who likes counting will be autistic, but for autistic people will go for repetitions. And that's the last thing I like. So again, going to eat that discovery, and in my case, I was lucky, and that's something that I have carried my, pretty much my whole life. That's what brings me joy. So it brings me joy <clears throat> for all my children, even when they're annoying. <laughs> okay. But mostly, uh, I, I like... I guess it's going to sound weird. I like going on my phone and I'm looking at weights. <laughs> I look at weights and I just scroll for a, that's two hours later. And yeah, that's my joy lately. It's just the emptiness. <laughs> but you did really have a way to communicate before you were in the 14 for high school. And so what would that message be for those teachers? Actually, as I said, every day. Boy, did a teacher ever give me trouble because he could not wrap his head around the idea that I knew about world issues or even know anything beyond sight words and simple concepts. My advice is to suspect non-speakers know and understand language. Never mind lots of other important things. Think about how much a stressful, uncooperative body is likely responsible for the challenges you observe. Thank you. And we do want to pass that message along to our teachers. Then I'm to know that it's uh, yeah, part of the message that our understanding is better. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. thank you for all the panelists. Um, and the people who were able to present virtually, um, hearing your stories just really helps us to um, empathize, but also just really helps us to know that the work that we're all doing, um, we got to continue to do what we're doing and do it better. <laughs>